Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I call this meeting to order. This is the Finance and Government Operations Committee of the City Council. Councillor Lewis, Councillor Pena are excused this evening. Councillor Bassan will be serving as alternate for Councillor Pena today. All other committee members are present today via Zoom. This is a remote or online meeting where all participants will be on a video or audio conference. Members of the public have the opportunity to address the committee if they have signed up for public comment per the rules published on the agenda and on our website Friday. We will call for speakers when we get to the individual agenda item that they signed up for. Here are the public comment ground rules. Comments are to be addressed to the committee members only. Each participant has two minutes to present. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the meeting. We will now move on to agenda item A, and that's EC-40. And EC-40 is declaring lot eight, block 26, um, email man addition near 528 Charleston Street, Southeast not essential for municipal purposes. And move approval, need a second. Second. Second by, was that Councillor Feeblecorn? Thank you, Councillor Feeblecorn. And Councillors, any questions or any comments for, the, any questions from the staff or many administration? Doesn't look like we have any, I don't see any hands raised. So ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on four zero. Okay, we will now move on to agenda item EC-67. Um, this is EC-67 declaring 2117 Osuna Road Northeast, not essential for municipal purposes. Um, this is the, and I move approval. I need a second. Second. Second from Councilor um, Champagne. Champagne. And, and uh, so here we go. This one here, um, I just wanted to ask the administration a question in reference to what they're doing with the property. I know we have Police Athletic League in there and uh, mainly want to know two things where Police Athletic League has moved to and if they're if they're doing okay. And also, um, what exactly is going to happen? Is this going to be sold or scraped? Uh, Council Chair, we have uh, Matthew Whalen uh, here to speak on that. Uh, Council Chair and Councilors. Um, so we have been working with the current uh, tenant and their nonprofit. Uh, we have located another facility that they can possibly use. Um, we are in discussions for an MOU for that new that new location. Um, and the current tenant has about 24 days left to remove their items from that current location. What's what's going on currently? Are they still in there or have they moved anything at all? Uh, Council Chair, um, I have gone over there. They have moved some things, but for the most part, a lot of their equipment is still there. Um, but they do still have time. I know they are going to be holding an event, I think, this Saturday or next Saturday, where they will be selling some of their equipment because they have a lot of equipment. Um, and from what I've been told, they will be storing the rest, whatever they can't use at a new location that if we come to an agreement with them. No, I just wanted to make sure that we have some progress going there. Are we helping them in any way or to move? Uh, Council Chair, uh, no. They're using their own volunteers and their own um, team to move the, the stuff that they have. Uh, whenever we decide, whenever the MOU is completed, if they end up using another city facility, we will let them into there so they can set up their ring and some equipment in there. And would we be helping them at all move or is that up to them all the time? Uh, Council Chair, uh, I believe it is up to them. Okay. And is that normal? That's just the normal practice, no matter who it would be. We were depending on, I mean, it shouldn't matter, right? Any entity that has similar obligation or, you know, st status, do we always help them or do we always let them move on their own? Uh, Council Chair, to my knowledge, whenever we work with a nonprofit like that and they use one of our buildings or facilities, it's up to the tenant to move or furnish their facility. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, so they still have 24 days to get everything moved and then the rest store. And it looks like they're selling their equipment off. So 
Um, thank you for that. Um, anybody else have any questions? Council Bassan's hands up. Council Bassan. Mr. Chair, thank you. And I'm glad to hear, uh, Mr. Whalen, I'm really glad to hear about the new MOU. I know that that's something that came up as a problem that this current nonprofit does not have a legal MOU with the city. So I appreciate that the city has been doing everything they can to still try to do their best to accommodate. What the last I heard, the tenant is not allowed to be inside of the facility that they're currently at. So are they going to be allowing people to come in this weekend to view items in order to make sure that they might be able to purchase them? And is that safe? And what is the expectation there? Oh, council chair and council Bassan, my understanding is they're going to have like an outdoor sale that they'll be bringing stuff outside for people to look at. I know the equipment includes like uh, bicycles, stationary bikes mainly, um, and smaller equipment. Uh, you are correct. They're not allowed to be on site or in the facility without city staff represent represented there. Um, they do have a contact person in uh, family and youth services that they have been working with. They do schedule time to go in with that person and he unlocks the door for them and gives them access to the facility for as long as they need it. And we do have city staff on site there while they're moving things just to ensure that things are getting moved properly. Okay, thank you. Oh, and I don't know if... Um... Mr. Chair's question was answered on whether or not the city wants to raise the property or sell it. Um, Council Chair uh, and Council Bassan, I think at this time we are surplusing it. The building is old. I think it, there is a possibility that it could possibly be demoed uh, just for that purpose and then have the piece of land and then evaluate then. Okay, so they, we don't have that possibility yet, whether it's going to be demoed or not. I just no. like to see it demoed since they were since they were uh since they were essentially since that building can't be used anymore i would essentially hope that it gets demoed yep. council chair this is uh, kevin Soroso. um we have not made that decision yet we wanted to get through this process first uh we do we we did have a plan at one point to to demolish the building we will resurrect that plan and look through that and and weigh our options if if there's an opportunity for us to make a quick sale um, if there's interest in it and we can, you know, we can surplus it pretty quickly and easily without incurring the cost of demo, we will do that. Um, but if it looks like it may take a little bit of time or if folks are really not interested in the building um, as we put our feelers out there, then we'll incur those costs and demo it. Um, we do believe if it's going to sit for any period of time that it's best just to demo it so it doesn't become a haven for um, shenanigans. <clears throat> Thank you, because that's what we've been seeing around the city with a lot of vacant property is there were shenanigans is that exactly. So um, one of the other things that's, that's important is I I just think that uh, the only thing I don't want to have happen is that we put somebody else in there and then start refurbishing it. Um, I have no problem with it being sold. I have no problem with it being um, demoed. But, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't fix it for them. So we shouldn't fix it for someone else. We should either demo it or sell it and that's my piece thank you thank you any other questions or comments council basan mr chair i just wanted to clarify too that it's and i, I think mr sorso summed it up great but at the same time as the councilor representing the location for this district i just want to say like if the city can sell it it's my understanding that the building can be refurbished it's right. just that we are choosing not to do it so if there's a private buyer that wants to do that then i'm not too eager to you know, demolish the entire property just for the sake of selling it as land. I'm totally good with that. Any other questions? Okay, with that, we can move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a four zero. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to agenda item EC70. Um, that's EC70, Mayor's Recommendation of Award of RFP 2023-463 DSW EV Recyclable Material Processing and Marketing Services. Um, move approval. Need a second. Second. Second by Councillor Sampine. And Councillors, any questions for the staff? Councilor Fiebelkorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I just wanted to know if there was any consideration when we had this new RFP to including curbside glass pickup as a service that the city offers. Um, and if, if that was considered, how much would it add to the cost? And if it wasn't considered, why? Uh, council Chair and Council People Court, um, glass has been done in the past uh, at some of our recycle sites. We are looking into possibly adding it to this new RFP, depending on how the facility is built, because it is, it is uh, you can't put it in a single stream. It has to be segregated. However, um, depending on how we move forward in negotiations with the new recycler, that is a possibility. Uh, and we won't know the costs until we start getting into negotiations and seeing what is in there. But I, as of the RFP was written right now, I don't think glass was in there. And thank you. And so why would we have not put it in the RFP to just get it included moving forward? Uh, council chair and council people court. Um, our goal was to continue the recycling program as we have it and Glass, we still do recycle glass at our drop-off sites. Uh, glass is another component that requires special equipment. So we wanted to try and get the RFP to the for the Merc that we currently have with new sorters, but it is something that could be explored. And what would be the process of exploring that? If it's not in this RFP, it doesn't seem like it's going to be explored anytime soon. Uh, Council Chair and Council People Corn, we could talk to the new contractors and see what options they have for us, what they could offer us when it comes to glass recycling. Um, as we had in the past when we had a contract with, um, I don't remember, the Growstone was the company we had used in the past before they went out of business. Uh, we still currently are recycling glass, like I said, at our convenience centers and our, our uh, um, drop-offs. And we do send that into Arizona and other areas to be recycled. Thank you. It's my it's my understanding that glass is one of the not profitable um, smallest loss of money streams of recycling there is. And I would really like us to encourage and maximize that recycling within our city. And I, I understand that in the past I've been told um, every time I talk about this, that the reason that we do not offer curbside recycling is because it takes special training for the pickup folks. Um, but the alternative is having every single citizen in the city of Albuquerque putting a bunch of glass in their car and transporting it to a drop-off center themselves, which also has certain public safety problems. So I would really like to see if we could add that in. Um, disappointed to see that it wasn't added in now, but it feels like something that we really need to be exploring for the city. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Peeblecorn. Uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, I have a few questions and I, I do also probably have another one based off of what Council Peoplecorn just asked, but I don't know if I might have more questions. I know that there's some public comment for this mm -hmm. bill and I don't know if you would rather um, do that first or if you want me to ask and then go to that and then maybe ask again. Um, let's go to public comment. Good point. Um, Mr. Cordines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Up first, we have Michael Cadigan followed by Matt Munoz. Welcome, former Councillor Michael Cadigan. How are you, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Councillor, Mr. Chairman and Councillors. My name is Michael Cadigan. I represent Universal Waste Systems Incorporated, and we actually urge a deferral or a do not pass recommendation on this item. As you know, Universal Waste System is a, a family-owned solid waste company that provides services to a number of counties and cities around New Mexico. And we're currently developing a transfer station at 5520 Broadway. And we look forward to a good business relationship with the city in the future in that regard. Universal Waste was interested in bidding on this project, but we decided not to because the RFP specifically required that the bidder identify a site that was within 10 miles of the city fleet yard facility where, it, where the operations would took, take place. Because our transfer station is not yet fully permitted for recyclables, we chose not to submit a bid. However, we found the waste management's technical proposal indicates that they have identified three potential sites for a MRF facility, but they don't currently have a facility. They don't own one, they don't lease one, they don't have control of one. 
As you'll recall, the city has spent the last several years trying to develop a transfer station and has met everywhere they looked, it was met with substantial neighborhood opposition. The only IDO zone where transfer stations are allowed are the NRSU zones, and there are very few of those in the city, most of which are actually cemeteries, strangely. So we know that if uh, the, if waste management needs to develop a site, it will be uh, met with extreme neighborhood opposition. The waste management's proposal says that they don't develop a site, they're going to simply ship all of the unprocessed recyclables to Arizona or Utah, where they will be sorted and uh, processed by workers in other states. That would mean shipping dozens of jobs out of Albuquerque and to those other states, which would be bad for our economy. And finally, the last paragraph does indicate that the cost proposal will increase to cover any additional operating costs that waste management incurs, including gross profits. We think this is not a fair deal for the ratepayers, not a fair deal for the city, and we would urge that this, uh, this proposal be rejected or at least deferred to give the administration further time to consider whether they want to go forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councilors. Thank you. Up next, we have Matt Munoz, followed by Ty Tostenson. Mr. Munoz, go ahead. Uh, you are muted, sir. Thank you. Pardon me, I'm sorry about that. Good evening, Chair and Counselors. My name is Matt Munoz, and I'm here to voice my opposition to the waste management response to the recyclable materials processing contract. There are two major flaws that need to be brought to the council's attention, and I believe these flaws are egregious enough that I ask this body at a minimum not to take action tonight and potentially not to take action at all on this proposal. The first major issue is the complete lack of transparency regarding costs and fees. Page 9 of Waste Management's proposal is very concerning as a rate-paying citizen. The last paragraph states, quote, Waste Management reserves the right to increase the processing fee any increase in the processing fee may include operating and gross profit margins, end quote. Waste management claims the right to raise rates for any reason they see fit, including to increase their profit margins. This will be an increased cost to Albuquerque residents. Increasing the fees means increasing the rates to your constituents. Secondly, page 47 of the waste management proposal states, Quote, waste management has identified three potential locations that have suitable zoning and meet cri city criteria to house a new materials recycling facility. Nowhere in their proposal do they actually give the exact location of these three potential sites. The proposal should not be awarded as waste management has failed to identify the actual site. The RFP requires a location, and Albuquerque citizens and neighborhood associations deserve to know the location but it's absent in the waste management proposal. Your constituents have a right to know if a new waste processing facility is going to be in their backyards before you vote on this, this proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Munoz. Up next, we have Ty Tostenson, followed by Barrett Jensen. Mr. Tostenson, go ahead. Mr. Chair, counselors, Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ty Tossinson. I'm the vice president over Waste Connections, New Mexico Assets, as of late January this year. Although I'm new to Al the Albuquerque market, I'm not new to Waste Connections as I just hit 10 years with the company, moving my family to five different states in that time. I love this company because of our de decentralized model and the autonomy we give local leadership. Yes, we're a big company, but we never want to feel that way. With that said, when I took the lead on New Mexico in January, I was surprised to see we were not the recommendation for the Recycle Material Processing and Marketing Services Contract RFP. This tip typically tells me one of two things. Our relationships aren't strong locally or we're significantly more expensive on our bid. First, talking with our local leadership, our general manager, Adam Meyer, did allude to some difficulties in the transition once we purchased Friedman Recycling in late 2021. With my moves to different markets around the country, I know relationships aren't formed or repaired overnight. That takes time and I understand we need to prove ourselves to the city that we are not Friedman Recycling. All that I ask is that you afford us that time. Second, I was surprised to see that from a cost standpoint, we scored a perfect 200 points on our RFP cost proposal. Furthermore, after a public records request, our government affairs manager, Barrett Jensen, 
believes the company recommended for the award has costs that are not overly transparent to the city of Albuquerque. Costs we believe are in the tens of millions of dollars. Is my understanding Barrett will be speaking on this further during his public comment, but something I felt the need to point out on my end. In closing, I again wanted to thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for having me on. I was very much hoping to introduce myself in person, but will settle for the Fairfield Inn off of Pan American. Planning on headed to Bubba's after this and watching the NCAA championship game, wishing it was UNM. Lastly, please let me make it clear that Waste Connections loves Albuquerque and hopes to grow with the city. With just over $60 million invested, currently supporting hundreds of local jobs and commitment to assisting Albuquerque in their sustainability initiatives, we hope and know this can be a great long-term relationship. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tostenson. Appreciate it. Up next, we have Barrett Jensen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Barrett Jensen, and I am the Government Affairs Manager for Waste Connections of New Mexico, which is a parent company of Roadrunner Waste Service and the Barco Recycling Facility. Our local team consists of nearly 120 members who are dedicated to safely serving the community of Albuquerque and beyond. I'm here to express our concerns related to EC-70 and to ensure that each committee member is given the opportunity to ask questions, not only to me, but to the recommending body that brought this to committee. With this being the Finance and Government Operations Committee, I'm going to keep my comments to just these topics. And cost is going to be the crucial piece of my public comment today. The recommendation states that there is no cost associated with the RFP. And although this is true as it relates to capital infrastructure costs, this statement is misleading as the Solid Waste Department will pay increased tipping fees that will impact the Solid Waste Department between $35 to $50 million for our analysis over the course of two decades keeping in mind that these monies are generated by fees that are assessed to all citizens and businesses in the city of Albuquerque. Additionally, the recommended proposal does not identify a site for the new facility, which can lead to serious future impacts to both cost and government operations for the solid waste department, and ultimately the city of Albuquerque. The proposed facility must be designed, permitted, constructed, and fully operational by October 1 of 2026. And if this timeline does not met, the recommended vendor has stated that the material from Albuquerque will be sent out of state, which would then require a transfer station to be constructed and permitted, which then inherently adds unnecessary transfer trucks that will be traveling on the already busy roads of Albuquerque and throughout the state. I would also like to include that the Solid Waste Department currently takes this material to our facility that is 0.4 miles away that is quite literally down the street from where the department dispatches its fleet. The RFP stated that any new facility must be within 10 miles of the Solid Waste Department, but without any identified site, there is no way for anyone to calculate the burden that this would place on the budget, but more importantly, the safety and morale of the drivers as the vehicle miles traveled will be increased and the cost per hour of the fleet will increase with it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Mr. Chair, that concludes public comment. Thank you. Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, I have several questions. Uh, a lot of these were touched upon by either Councilor Feeblecorn or even some of the speakers. Uh, but I'll start with Councilor Feeblecorn's comment because you said, Councilor Feeblecorn said that people would, you know, all these people would drive and have glass in their car to drive there, or they won't drive it at all, which quite frankly is what I do. I don't take glass when if I had curbside, I absolutely would do it. I know Councilor Feeblecorn just had a coronary. But uh, at the same time, people would maybe recycle more if we would do curbside and I would be one of them. Um, so do we have a general idea, Mr. Cox, of where the properly zoned areas are that we could feasibly put one of these this facility? I know that they weren't identified in here, but do we know where within a 10 mile range there's an option for that? Um committee and Councillor Bassan. Um, I don't, I would have to do a, a very quick map analysis that I can see if I can get it done briefly, but also as a reminder within 10 miles of the solid waste headquarters, that is not just the city of Albuquerque, but also falls on to Bernalillo County and, and possibly uh, Sandoval as well. Um, but let me and, dig in. No, and I'm not expecting you necessarily to, to do that per se this second, but I do think it's worth mentioning that, you know, I mean, we should have a general idea of different locations that this could happen at, especially if we're talking about building somewhere new versus utilizing what we have. Um, so in the RFP, 
it's not apples to apples and oranges to oranges either. I mean, you have roughly a $6 million response and a $30 million. I mean, we have using a current facility or building a new one. So to me, how can we move forward with an EC and, and selecting a business to do any of this when we're not actually, I don't even know if this would count as a fair RFP if we're not making sure that the requirements were the same. And then we heard from another one that said that they're building a transfer station right now, which is why they didn't actually go through with the bid, even though they scored on here. So they scored on the RFP, even though it's 24 or whatever, you know, but at the same time, how is it, how is this, how is this an accurate RFP when so many of these things are not similar? I feel like we had companies bidding on different projects. So I guess that would be for the admin maybe. Right. Is how, how can we justify that this RFP is something that went out with equal, you know, and understandably equal, people could understand what was being requested and evaluated. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. And we're looking at the mayor's conference room for some clarification. Council Chair, Councilor Bassan, again, Kevin Suraso. Um, so first off, I would like to say the, the folks that have spoken today had an opportunity to protest. They did provide they, they did provide proposals and they have they would be would have been awarded an opportunity to protest. And I, I don't think this is the appropriate venue to protest, and the protest period is passed. So I just want to put that out there. With respect to the costs and assumptions that are being made about the costs in the award that is before you, we have not entered into contract negotiations yet. We are aware of that clause. Matthew, Whale and I were talking about that uh, recently, the, that clause in there about increasing um, costs. We can certainly uh, control that through a, a good contract. And I just want to go back a little bit to uh, the fairness of this. There is an opportunity during the RFP for pro potential uh, bidders, proposers. I'm going to say proposers because this was not a low bid. It was a, a quality or a, uh, an evaluation-based process. So questions can be asked during and prior to submission of the proposals. Um, Offerers can protest on the specifications. They can also protest on the award. And we did not see protests on either. And we did not see these questions come prior to the award. So I, I, we, we can talk about fair and evaluation, but we do RFPs all the time. I do understand that one company has a facility that they were going to leverage. Another company would have to create and build a facility. But... Um, you know, none of these questions came up before the, you know, the end of the, the protest period. Thank you. Mr. Chair and Mr. Soroso, I guess to me, the question's coming up now by me, not because of them. I mean, we should be able to have an answer of why we think that building a new facility is good, which I'm not trying to argue the point. Maybe I just want to know why is building a new facility the best way to go? And why do we expect prices not to be raised because of that? Because, you know, building a new facility, wherever that may be, the high, there's a high likelihood that the rate's going to go up for people. I mean, and to me, that's just common sense. That has nothing to do with the questions that were posed tonight. I had these written down beforehand, too. And I mean, looking at it, why is one score so significantly low? Why is one, that's one score? Then you have another score that's based off of using the current facility. And then you have a third score that's based off of building a new facility. I'm asking, why is why do we need to believe that the RFP process was equal-ish or, you know, I mean, I'm not allowed to ask these questions during this process. I'm just learning about it now. But they're very different to the point where I don't understand how I can be reading this and assume that the same level of evaluation was used to score. I could look at this and say, all right, Albuquerque wants to build a new facility. Let's give it to that company. Albuquerque wants to use, you know, a facility that's already here. Let's give it to that. That's how I see this. So I'm wondering, how can I understand the process that was used to make this decision aside from just scoring? Because the scores don't seem like they're leveraged equally. 
Matthew Whalen uh, will speak to Council Chair. Uh, Council Ms. Arnold will speak to a portion of your question, and then if Kevin wants to ju jump in. Um, so <clears throat> the RFP went out. The facility that's currently here has been here for over 15 years or so. Um, the equipment is a lot older. The facility is a lot older. Um, but if they would have won, we would have negotiated with them as well to try and get current um, optical sorters, get up to speed, just really bring things up to date because recycling has changed and continues to change and it continues to evolve. You know, And so as new equipment comes out, as new technology comes out, it's important that we're constantly improving with it. Um, our contamination rate is fairly high right now. And we know that we had a study done by uh, some consultants that if we can get our contamination rate down, it gets our cost down as well, because depending on how the contract is structured. So I think it's not that we want a new facility. It's that we went out to RFP because we've been using the current facility for over 15 years. We've ex expended that contract. It began with Friedman and is now with Waste Connections. But we just wanted to go out to RFP to see what can be best for Albuquerque and what can be best for the residents of Albuquerque, as opposed to just wanting a new facility. And um, you did have a question that said they're building a transfer station. The transfer station is different than a recycling facility. So the transfer station is just for waste. Now, you can build a transfer station with a recycling facility next to it or joined to it. But... The facility they're building is a transfer station. They're not building a recycling plant that they're going forward with. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, so I think it's important to all the residents that we do all of our due diligence. And we did have contracted uh, consultants that were not scoring members, but they were subject matter experts on the RFP, uh, during the RFP process that those on the, the, the panel could ask questions um, of those uh, who had put proposals in. And council president, councilor, if I might add as well. So um, experience and qualifications, that's one category that the offerers had to write a narrative and explain to us what their experience was, what their qualifications are. History of performance, another category that they had to provide a narrative, um, proposed approach, this goes to what uh, Mr. Whalen was saying. Um, as you approach the changes in the in the recycling environment over the years, what is the approach to that? And the folks that were evaluating this clearly, you know, scored higher for um, one offerer over the other two offerers. Um, and and I can't speak to any of the individuals who scored this, but we put folks you know, that have solid waste and recycling experience on this. To Matthew's point, we also had um, subject matter experts from the industry in there as well. So all of these folks reading these proposals, commenting, having conversations um, in, in their valuation sessions about this, simply scored one of them slightly higher than the other. Now we talk about cost, the winning, the, the bidder or the proposer that we're here before you talking about an award to did score lower on the cost proposal. And this, I'm sure, is because the other offerer already had a facility and their cost would probably be lower because they're they're not starting from ground zero. So they're, you know, the the points are there, the evaluation is there, there's a criteria for evaluation. Um, you know, I would say. If you score 24 out of a thousand points, you've probably written a pretty poor proposal. And that's probably why there's a 24 on here for one of the proposers. So, you know, it's just a matter of how, how well you prepare, how well you write your uh, narrative and the information that you provide and the experience that you can show uh, when we're evaluating. Mr. Chair, I have a couple more questions as Part of partial to follow up, and then in addition to that, Councilor, uh, do you mind if I get another question? In? Uh, Councilor John Pine's been waiting to ask his question. Okay. Or do you, you want to finish? Keep... No, okay, they're answering. She's actually ahead. asking some of the questions I've written down. Yeah. Let's go ahead and go, Councilor. Yeah. What's on? Okay. okay. So proceed. It's okay. Go for it. Okay. Yes, uh, so, what happens to the current facility? Uh, if there's a, the new the RFP that's being awarded is for a new facility somewhere. Um, so what's going to happen to the current facility? 
when the new contract begins? Uh, council chair and counselor, I, I can't speak to that because it's a privately owned facility, much like uh, the new facility would be privately owned. Okay, thank you. And then uh, if the new facility is not, if we don't have a location prepared, planned and identified, and if it's not built and up and running by October of 26, then what happens? Uh, council chair and counselor, there is a contingency plan. One of our public speakers did comment on the contingency plan in the proposal that they would be shipping um, for a period of time until their facility is up and operational. And with respect to any additional cost, we will uh, make sure when we neg negotiate the contract that we are very clear that they have a deadline and we're not paying additional costs if uh, we're not paying additional costs if they can't get their act together. In addition, uh, the RFP language calls for liquidated damages if they can't meet the terms of um, our agreement. And one final thing, we're talking about contract negotiations. It's quite possible you approve this, we go into contract negotiations, and we are so hard and steadfast with you know what we want Contract negotiations could break down and we could be to the second offerer. I mean, that's that's a possibility um, as we go into contract negotiations. And we've had that happen before. We've you know not been able to come to terms with some um, contract negotiations and we you know go back to the second place offerer. And the last thing, Mr. Chair, is that in addition to that, Mr. Soros, so I hope that when you're in contract negotiations, which I'm well aware we're not involved in, you know, that when it's being kind of rigid or however the term is going to be about, you know, making sure that the cost does not increase if something like needing to transport occurs, that we're really mindful that that's in very specifically not going to increase for the actual residents in Albuquerque who are paying the bill, unless we have a better justification about why to do this. Because to me, it's about quality and quality not about just quality and quantity at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Cal uh, Councilor Champagne. Thank you, Councilor um, Chairman. Uh, this is for the administration and just out of curiosity, both the councilors have asked a lot of questions that I had written down when I read this, but when I'm reading the analysis breakdown, if I'm saying it properly, um, I noticed an issue and I, want to hope that it's clerical and not strategically but in the cover analysis you guys left out questions six and seven now going through and those those questions are is there an entity already doing this and what happens if it isn't awarded um going through everything else you guys had six and seven so why would you leave out six and seven on something that's obviously controversial right now why leave out the information of is this already being done and what happens if this doesn't go through? Council Chair, Councillor, um, we are researching your question at the moment. We're looking at the cover analysis. Um, I'm going to chalk it up to an oversight at the moment. Um, but we you didn't know, oversight it on the other 12 that were there, which just this specific one. Matthew, we'll have to look into it. We don't know. We'll, we will, we will look at it. Sorry. We can't answer the question at the moment. Okay. All right. And perfect. This is the last question on a follow-up because it says that it has to be a site location within 10 miles of what I'm guessing is Edith and Griegos, from what I'm being told. Uh, what sites are there that could hold this facility? And, and Mr. Cox sent out a, a map and uh, because we requested it. Um, it doesn't give a lot around that area. In fact, the only thing I can really see is the big eye. And that's like near a cemetery and is all the people within the city traveling, visiting and wondering if Albuquerque is a wonderful place to live as they go through the big eye, get to see a huge recycle center. And I, for one, being the person who did 
the recycle center investigations for the police department know that they are not the prettiest site. I don't know if that was a question or more of just what do you what what is there a thought behind this process or uh, council chair and councilor champagne um you know that's what the requirements are we have done some research ourselves as we were preparing to build a transfer station years ago looking at properties within certain parameters around that area and there are properties located i can't tell you which ones they're looking at but there are some areas around that radius because uh, i think we did the study four years ago five years ago that we located i think six or seven locations um, that were available at the time for our own transfer station all right i just i fear that you're going to pick big eye and it's going to be just so beautiful for our tourism <laughs> so thank you councillor fieldler thank you mr chair um I just a couple more questions, sorry. Um, did the RFP require a location or did the RFP leave location to be determined at some future point? Uh, council Chair and Council People Court, there was a question asked during the RFP process by one of the uh, proposers on that exact thing. And it was noted in there that they had to have the ability to obtain by the time they went into contract. They didn't have to have a location identified per those questions as I'm looking at purchasing. Okay, thank you. So I, you know, I just, I, I have a problem with um, RFPs that are, um, you know, going to potentially change a location of a giant recycling facility and we don't ask for a location. Um, it just seems like a, a problem and it's not a problem of who replied or what their replies were it seems like a problem with the rfp itself um my other problem with the rfp itself is of course the curbside recycling um for glass and then i i just wanted to make sure i understood the contingency plan that is allowed in the in the rfp process is to ship recyclables elsewhere for processing if they don't you wrote me um the dot the timeline is that what i heard uh, council chair and council people court yes and then there was it was said that there was no cost to that but I, I do have to point out there is a giant cost to that um even if they cover the financial cost of that there's a cost to our citizens of having additional large machinery large trucks and with emissions going through what are some of our more low income neighborhoods um, at a time when that those emissions are going up, not down. So I think a plan to minimize those types of societal costs should have been included in the RFP. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor People for Mayor's Conference Room. Okay. Um, Council Chair, Councilors, I'd like to just hop back to questions six and seven, if I may, um, and provide answers to those. Um, I, I can't tell you why we six and seven are not on the cover uh, memo, other than I'm being told there may have been an update to this cover. And somebody may have used an older version of this cover memo that has now has additional questions, but... To answer question six, what happens if this is not approved? What happens to this project? Our recycling program ends now in 2026 uh, calendar fiscal. Uh, calendar. Okay, so calendar 26, um, our current recycling program with our, our contract with our contractor ends. Uh, we're doing this well ahead of time so that there's time to build up if, if there needs to be a build up. Um, and then this question number seven is, is there another provider that offers this service? Clearly, we've heard from our current provider that is providing this service. So, yes, there is another provider that provides this service, but we've chosen to go out to RFP so that we can get, you know, a competitive uh, response from uh, the, the industry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Counselors, any further questions? Mr. Chair, just one more quali uh, qualifying um, question. I, you know, I, I just heard that if this doesn't pass, that we will stop our recycling program. Is there some claim that we would not be have, we would not have time to actually do an RFP correctly and get this in place before 2026? Uh, Council Chair, Councilor, I, I did not mean to apply that we would stop recycling. I'm just, we are way ahead of this, which is where we always want to be with an RFP. But as you know, we are not always way ahead of things. Um, but our contract does end in 26. We're trying to get ahead of this. And I will just comment and say, to me, uh, you know, our we run a tight procurement process. We do RFPs all the time. And, you know, I would just say that from what I'm seeing, we have evaluated, we've had criteria. And I, you know, it seems like we have a good uh, option before us that's been well evaluated by our, our committee. And I, again, I did not mean to imply that we're going to stop recycling. Um, I, in my head, I thought, oh, I hope we don't get to a point where we're at risk. Um, but uh, I did not mean to imply at all that we would stop recycling. It's just the contract will end in 26 and we got to have a plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, you know, I'm just going to say I, the reason that I don't support this is not that there was a problem with the process of scoring the applicants. Um, my concern revolves around what was required in the RFP itself um, and has nothing to do with whether or not they were scored appropriately. Um, I think that as a city, we should be making sure that our RFPs require locations and that they require at least some analysis of adding things like glass curbside recycling pickup, um, things that we have been discussing for quite some time. Thank you, Councilor People Corn. Um, Mr. Cox, go ahead. You had a comment? Chair, I, I appreciate it. I just need clarification from the mayor's conference room. Um, I've written some information down um, on the analysis that says after the 2026 contract is expired, we will have the ability to extend that another three years. Is that is that correct or or not? Look, Council Chair and uh, Mr. Cox, yes, that is. We do have one more three year option with the current provider. Um, so we just really want to get ahead of the game, like like uh, Mr. Sarasal was saying. It's it, a transfer station or a recycling MRF material recovery facility. These are unique items that aren't built all the time. Uh, they require specific things, and it's just not something that's done very regularly. We entered into our contract with Friedman when we went to curbside back in, I think it was 2010, and that's they've been our provider ever since. They have now since sold to another company. And since we've been with that provider and the industry's changed, and I think we can all remember in 2018, uh, recycling changed completely when it came to uh, re revenues and expenses. And so we wanted to go out to RFP to see what was out there, to see what kind of response we would get, and to see if we can um, up, uh, either get a facility that's more up to date or with new um, optical sorters and new equipment, because the times have changed. Thank you. It doesn't look like anyone else here. Um, counselors, um, is there going to be an, another motion or are we just going to vote on this right now? Doesn't look like there's any other motion, so we're going to go ahead and put it to the vote. Um, real quick, before I'm going to make my comment, my biggest issue is location. I think it's important that the citizens of Albuquerque know where this facility is going to be placed. Um, I can go on about the other ones, but that's my my most um, prominent uh, question is the location so that we know where this big facility is going to be placed within our city and what neighborhood it's going to affect or or who is it who is it going to affect at this point so um, I think you can every, everybody can see where this is headed um, but we'll go ahead and go for the vote Councilor Bassan no Councilor Champagne no Councilor Fiebelkorn? No. Councilor Sanchez? No. That fills on a zero-four vote. 
Okay, um, we will now move on to agenda item D, that's EC-89. Sanchez, EC-89, declaring 341 Charleston Street Southeast, not essential for municipal purposes. And I move approval. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second. Councilor Champagne. And councilors, any questions? Any comments from uh, conference room? Any speakers? No, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll move to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Champagne. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 4 0 vote. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to agenda item E. That's EC 92. And that's Bear's recommendation of award for RFP um, 2024 517. I don't know what that AVI. Aviation. Aviation. Okay. So it's aviation. That's food and beverage concessions program. Um, reissue of remaining units at the Sunport. And move approval. Need a second. Second. Second, Councillor Feeblecorn. And Councillors, any questions? Mm -hmm. Councillor Bassan. Mr. Chair, I think that it would be nice if we could hear a little bit of an update as to um, for the public that's watching too, to understand uh, what this is about as far as the reissue of remaining units. I know that there's other councillors who have discussed uh, wanting to make sure that we do as much local, if not all local. Uh, and I want to hear kind of what that means and how it's going to look as far as what's remaining that is local or not on this uh, recommendation of award, please. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. That was one of my questions exactly. Um, Mayor Stockton, sir. Uh, Council Chair, Councilor, we have Manny Manriquez, who is very energetic and excited to tell you where we are. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, Council Chair, Councilors who are interested in uh, these, uh, these answers and these details. Thank you uh, for uh, expressing an interest. Um, as some of you might recall, uh, when we launched the program and began to shape the RFPs, it was our intention to have a majority of the new concessions units in the food and beverage program be uh, local recognizable brands. And so in the body of the RFP and the unit by unit description, we put uh, language indicating that we wanted to see local brands in, in these various units. And in the case of this RFP, which is a reissue and had four units uh, in it, um, only one of those was described as being a, a sought after national brand. And that's because to round out the program, we did want to have a, a few uh, out of the 16 food and beverage units be national brands. Um, in this case, uh, the respondent who we're recommending the award for combined one of the units in the food hall it was two different units that were combined into one. And so that's the Indian Pueblo kitchen um, that they proposed to combine in the food hall. And uh, in the A concourse, uh, they proposed a smash burger and a Frank's chicken and waffles. So two of those three, we've got uh, great, great local brands, very excited about that. Um, and then uh, as, as some of you will also recall, um, and for the members of the public who are here, um, in the previous award uh, that was that was given to uh, Fresquez companies, the, the strong majority of the brands that they are working with and therefore will deploy in the new program are also uh, local recognizable brands. So on balance, the, the strong majority as we'd intended, about 80% of the units are local recognizable brands. So does that get to your, your question, Councillor? Which one is specifically the national brand? It sounds like Indian Pebble Kitchen is here. Um, and then I know Frank's Famous Chicken is local. Is yes. it Smashburger then? Yes, correct. Uh, Councillor Sanchez, thank you for the question. Um, yes, it is uh, Smashburger. In fact, I believe will be the first Smashburger location in New Mexico. And then um, where's Tailwinds? Tailwinds uh, located, and is Tailwinds the person that owns the franchises that we're adding, and are they local? 
Uh, no, in fact, Tailwinds is a uh, medium-sized national concessions operator. Uh, and so they are collaborating with the local brands uh, in a brand licensing agreement with Frank's Chicken and Waffles and Indian Pueblo Kitchen. Um, how exactly those partnerships are fashioned um, will, will, will unfold um, in the coming uh, weeks and months. But typically the way they do it is they license the brand and they have the local uh, business inform uh, the strategy around service, development of the menu, and oftentimes they have consultation of the head chef of that local brand uh, informing the way uh, the, the recipes and the preparation of uh, the food and beverage offered at the end. Okay, thanks. I think you answered the question. Um, counselors, any other questions or comments? Doesn't look like any. So. I, I have one actually. Oh, Councillor Champagne has a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this for the administration on on this cover analysis on number seven. It says the service is already provided by another entity. Uh, you it it says in there that Frescas already does uh most of them, but you the remaining three had to be given to Tailwinds. Um, why wasn't Frescas just continuing with the other three? Why did it, it says a con two year contract expiration. The extension is that why? Uh, well, let me answer that one in detail, um, okay. Council Chair, Councilor Champagne. So, um, Fresquez uh, won the uh, the bid on the previous RFP, uh, and so they got um, twelve of the sixteen units that were in the the original RFP. Um, and because we didn't get a second responsive bid we had to reissue another RFP with these four remaining units. Now, Fresca's concessions could have proposed for this reissue of the RFP, but they opted not to. And so instead we had three different respondents uh, this time that we had to evaluate. And uh, Tailwind's concessions beat the other competitors out and, and therefore uh, are getting the recommendation of award. Thank you for the clarification. I That brings up something else for me. Um, you said there was 16, and if I'm doing my math correct, you had 12 uh, Indian Pueblo Cultural Centers, 13 Smashburgers, 14 Frank's Famous Chickens, 15. Who's 16? So um, initially, there were 16 units identified. However, in the reissue of the RFP, when we had four identified units, we did give the option of the proposers combining two adjacent units in the food hall. So that they could have essentially a bigger space, and so yeah. Tailwinds did opt to uh, to combine two of those units, and that's why we now end up with fifteen food and beverage establishments in the program. Got it, counselors. Any other questions? With that, we can move to a vote. Councilor Bassan, yes. Councilor Champagne, yes. Councilor Fablecorn, yes. Councilor Sanchez, yes. That passes on a 4 0 vote. Thank you. We'll now move on to agenda item F, EC 93. And that's EC 93 is commuter airline terminal lease and operating agreement between the city of Albuquerque and Advanced Air LLC. Um, move approval. Need a second. Second. Second, Councillor Beeblecorn. And anyone to speak? No, Mr. Chairman. And, Councillors, any questions or comments? None. Seeing none, we'll move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Passes on 4 0 vote. We will now move on to agenda item G, and that's EC 96. Uh, EC 96, executive communication for the submission of the five year forecast, FY 2024 to FY 2028. Um, move approval. Second. Second by Councillor Champagne. Um, Councillors, any questions or comments for the administration? Seeing none, I, uh, we can move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. 
Councillor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 4 0. We will now move on to agenda item H. That's O 5. Councillor Fiebelkorn by request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is O 5, amending 11 3, the Human Rights Ordinance. I'll move it to pass. And I'll go ahead and second it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I also just go ahead and move the committee sub um, that we that you all have in your iPads. Uh, this is this is not changing anything about the original bill. Um, it's just formatting and making it in a format that works better for a council staff in terms of enrolling and engrossing. So I will move um, committee sub one in your iPads. Thank you. Um, any questions on committee sub Councilor Bassan? It was a second. Oh, it was a second. So I have a second for the committee sub. Councilors, any questions or comments? Um, with that, we can move to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Champagne? Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. That passes on a 4 0 vote. We'll now move on to an agenda item. Do we have to vote on oh, Mr. I'm Chair. sorry. Now yes. it's time to vote for the uh, yes. the bill itself. Sorry. Mr. Chair, that. I believe there I was mean, someone we, to speak. Yeah. Oh, speaker. I'm sorry. We have a speaker. Go ahead. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Chair. We have Anami Das to speak. I, I was Ms. Das, go ahead. Uh, as the chair of the Human Rights Board, I want to make myself available, um, and I appreciate y'all's work. Thanks. Terrible connection. Do you, you want to try again? Um, yeah, sure. I was just here to uh, express support and uh, answer any questions that y'all might have for the Human Rights Board chair. Uh, Thank you. Any questions or comments? At this point, okay, we'll need a vote on the final Mr. bill. Chair. As, yes, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, for some of the definitions, I'm just wondering if that is where were they? Where were they from? As far as how the definitions, I mean, I know it's is it Webster? Is it? Yeah. And I, I mean, in all fairness, I do not agree with some of them as official definitions. Mr. Chair, I, I believe there's somebody in the mayor's conference room that can speak, but let me just take the first um, try at this. Um, this bill is in in uh, response to the state updating their human rights ordinance. And so it is my understanding that all the definitions in here um, basically came from the state's language. And I should point out that we do have to follow the state's um, human rights ordinance. And so I think it's important for us to update for our local community to show not only that we support human rights, um, but also allow us to have enforcement mechanisms at a local level rather than having to go through the state um, to enforce that. So um, I, I would welcome the mayor's conference room to speak to, you know, definitions if I was wrong on any of that. Mayor's conference room, please. Mr. Chair, Councilor, Councilor Feeblecorn. Hi, this is Shanna with the Office of Policy. Um, Councillor Feeblecorn was mostly correct. This ordinance seeks to, for the most part, mirror what the state of New Mexico recently updated in their Human Rights Act. However, the state of New Mexico Act does not have all of the definitions outlined as we are choosing to outline in our ordinance. They, they uh, aim to protect all the same classes of persons that we identify here, but the state act is missing some of the definitions. To make sure that we have an enforceable ordinance, uh, we crafted some of the definitions in-house. Um, that would be sex assigned at birth, pregnancy, childbirth, or condition related to childbirth or pregnancy. You'll find that those are classes protected in the Human, right, Human Rights Act at the state level, but aren't defined. Um, so when I was crafting the definitions for uh, this ordinance, I looked to how other cities have defined those classes of persons as a measure of best practices. Councillor, um, but Champagne's got a question. Uh, just to follow up to what you just said, what other cities did you use? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Champagne, I don't have the reference in front of me now, but I could get that information for you prior to final action by the full council. Much appreciation. And Mr. Chair, if I may, you know, I think um, I, I had not realized that those weren't in the state statute, but um, all the ones that Ms. Schultz spelled out are pretty straightforward. Sex assigned at birth, pregnancy, um, those are things that I think we all know what they mean and they don't seem very controversial to me. So um, while I understand the need to put them in a definitional form and put them into our ordinance just to avoid any problems, um, I, I really don't see any controversy on those ones that were just spelled out by Ms. Schultz. Thank you. Looks like we have Councillor Rogers that wants to chime in here. Go ahead, Councillor Rogers. Hi, everybody. I just want to point out sex assigned at birth is actually uh, mandated by the federal government with the Affordable Care Act. At UNM Hospital, it was one of my jobs to roll that out to staff. And so that definition is absolutely rooted in federal law for the Affordable Care Act and is how we at the hospital had to ask folks about um, sex assigned at birth. So I just wanted to point that out, that that one is absolutely rooted in, in law, federal law. Thank you, Councilor Rogers. Oh, I don't know Thank okay, you. anything else? Any other further comments? Nope. Okay, we'll move to the vote. Original bill has substituted. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Champagne. Uh, yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 4 zero vote. We will now move on to agenda item O. I. Or I. I. That's O-15. Councilor Bassan by request. Mr. Chair, O-15 is repealing Chapter 9, Article 6, ROA 1994, Food and Beverages Ordinances, and creating the Food and Service Retail Ordinance. I move it to pass. And second. Second by Councillor Champagne. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the committee substitute, and then I can explain it. Okay. We need a second on moving this committee substitute. Second. Second by Councillor Champagne. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, this committee substitute has, I believe it's four changes. I want to make sure to be, I'll explain those so that we can hopefully get that passed and then move forward with some of the rest of the discussion. Um, the committee substitute on page five, line 20 or line 30, it says upon receipt of a pre-inspection application, we're going to, add, we want to add the word complete pre-inspection -applic pre application. Um, and I also want to make sure to let everyone know that Dr. Domena is uh, here tonight to, and then I think um, Ms. Peterson is also in the mayor's conference room if you all have questions for them. But we wanted to add in the word complete, complete pre-inspection application. And then another change is on line 32 of that page. The original ordinance had five working days uh, written in it for the uh, in enforcement authority to be able to contact the ap applicant to schedule a pre-opening inspection. This ordinance says reasonable amount of time and through some discussions with constituents and the department, reasonable is a very subjective term and the department was open to bringing it back to say five working days so that it can actually have a specific allotted amount of time. On page six, line 18, it, it says in the ordinance that we're proposing a civil penalty will be assessed, um, but we want to change that in the committee substitute to say a civil penalty may be assessed. On page seven, section 11, this uh, changes the entire section to now read a food establishment that was issued a permit with a variance while seeking a liquor license from the state of New Mexico in accordance with the Liquor Control Act is found to be in operation without first notifying the enforcement authority and passing a pre-opening inspection with a grade of approved or conditional approved. This is talking about making sure that if someone doesn't go back to environmental health to get their actual permit after they get their liquor license, that they can have a penalty because they can't just permanently uh, operate 
using a variance instead. So we wanted to make sure to clarify the link. And I believe the last thing the committee substitute is on page 16. Uh, line 12, uh, section B, criminal penalties. It says any person who violates any provision of this article is guilty of a petty misdemeanor. We want to change it to read any person convicted of a violation of any provision of this article is guilty of a petty misdemeanor. We wanted to make sure that the due process is there and it's not just that this ordinance makes sure to signify guilt. So with that, I will entertain any questions. I imagine Dr. Demena, if there's anything I do, Dr. Demena, I should ask too, is there anything I missed? Um, Councilor Passan, uh, not in the uh, substitute. I think that uh, that covered everything that we expected to see there. So, Mr. Chair, I would entertain any questions. Otherwise, I'd urge your support and then um, move move on to hopefully the bill as substituted for further discussion. Um, there's also something in here that states that uh, fees would be increased. Can you explain that? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's going to be on the ordinance. This was just for the committee substitute and the changes on the substitute versus the proposed ordinance. Okay. Do you want me to explain that or should yes, we please. do the substitute way... first? Yeah, go ahead and explain it. Okay. Uh, so kind of moving out of the substitute portion of this back into the proposed ordinance portion, that one portion of it uh, is that there is a fee schedule that's going to be um, eventually proposed. It's not uh, included in the ordinance itself. It's going to be an appendix that goes through a public hearing process. And I would invite Dr. Demena to be able to explain that a little bit further, as I know that it is a large concern to constituents. And I imagine when we go to public comment, we might hear from some of them. Uh, but again, that's different than what we're talking about on the committee substitute. So I would hope that the fee portion is not what's going to hold up the, the decision on the substitute. Okay, did you, did, just wanted to make clarification. We're going to go ahead and vote on the substitute first. Um, and let's go ahead and uh, we have one speaker. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll hear from the speaker. Okay, Mr. Chair, can we can we please vote on the committee substitute first? Sure. And then open up to the bill as substituted so that we can decide how to proceed with public comment, but actually while including these changes that we have found necessary. Okay, anybody have any comments in reference to the substitute? The bill, uh, the substitution. No comments. Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on the committee sub. Councillor Basson. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Now we'll open up to uh, public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have Carol White. Uh, just good. Thank you, Miss White. Go ahead. You are muted. Yes, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Carol White. I'm the CEO of the New Mexico Restaurant Association, and I'd like to thank you for the chance to speak about these changes to the Albuquerque Food Code. We've been asking the city to upgrade to the latest food code for years. I believe right now they're on the 2009, um, and for years we've been asking them to be in sync with the state and the county codes. Um, and to be in sync with the current science in the 2022 food code. While I've been working with the Environment Department and Councillor Besson for the last week, I do feel like this process seems to be rushed. Many stakeholders have not even been notified that these changes are being made. The fee schedule, which came to me last Friday, needs to be reviewed. The restaurant fees alone are proposed to go up to $900 when restaurants outside of Albuquerque in the state pay only $200. Also, the department decides if a restaurant has more than one fee per restaurant, which is a, a little too subjective for us. We feel like this should be a fee per building inspection. Um, I have additional written comments that have been addressed, but I'm waiting to see uh, the committee substitute, which I have not seen, and I'm also waiting to hear back from my members on how this ordinance and the rules affect them. Um, Councillor Basson just mentioned how what the procedure is going to be for developing rules for this ordinance. Um, in my experience, rule, rules are promulgated after an ordinance is passed with outside input. Is there a plan for citizen input? on the rules. So that's that's my comments. And thank you. 
uh, Councillor Bassan and Dr. Domina for working with me as well. Thank you, Mrs. Wright. Um, Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of questions. The first is I would like to hear from um, Environmental Health Department about how these fees will be set um, now and in the future, how they would change if and when they needed to change. Mayor's conference room. Uh, Chair Sanchez and Councillor Feeblecorn, thanks for the question. Um, there is uh, the fee analysis, the fee tables um, to start us off have been completed, and I think those were distributed. Um, there, are, there are two parts to what's actually happening with that. Um, if you're familiar with the way we currently do our, our fee uh, structure, most restaurants in particular are paying a permit fee that is between $200 and $700 a year, depending on what they reported for their adjusted gross receipts in the previous year. So it makes it very difficult for us to bill them. It makes it very difficult for them to have an idea what they're gonna be paying. Um, but by and large, we looked back at this for, for many, many years and the vast majority of restaurants are actually paying the full 700. Um, so most of them fall in that category where they're paying that amount anyway. So that is to us sort of our baseline. Uh, the new fee structure moves away from that uh, gross receipts model and moves into what we have already adopted in years past as a risk-based model that dictates to us how frequently we will inspect a place. And um, without, without getting into too much of the behind the scenes nitty gritty, has a lot to do with how much uh, of, a, of a workload a facility will place on us. So some very simple facilities we can be in and out of, it doesn't take very long to inspect, there aren't very many critical points that we're concerned with versus a more elaborate operation or one that has very hazardous foods or one that is serving very susceptible populations is at a higher level of risk takes longer for us to do that inspection and we have to inspect it more frequently. So the, the nature of the, uh, the menu, the nature of the clientele and the frequency that we need to inspect based on risk is how we're establishing the new fee structure. Um, so that's, that's what you see in the tables that were provided. That everything that's there in the tables is a starting point that's based on two things. One, uh, we had, uh, I think in 2022, the Office of Internal Audit uh, conducted an audit on the division that does the food inspections and found that we were very uh, very much undercharging for fees uh, based on comparable jurisdictions. We took on a fee analysis of our own to look at what we considered that to kind of look like for us, which got into more apples to apples fee comparisons. And we basically came to the same conclusion that we would need to in order to keep up, we'd need to set the fees at a slightly higher rate. In some cases, it's a much higher rate because we found that there were some types of facilities that are very high risk, very demanding on the program that have been paying uh, what I would essentially call like a nonprofit level fee for many, many years. So that's where you'll see some of the biggest adjustments. Um, but we are very sensitive to, uh, uh, well, I guess one, how much uh, culturally uh, restaurants in Albuquerque mean to, to the community. Uh, we certainly know uh, we've worked with uh, the Restaurant Association in the past. I worked in restaurants for many years before I came to Environmental Health, so we have a pretty good idea of what the margins look like. Uh, so we try not to balance too much the, of any of that load on them as well. So a lot of them will go from 700 to the vast majority would be 900, as Ms. White uh, explained. What what uh, I started to say, and I'm sorry, uh, what we have there on the tables right now is what we are proposing as a starting point. But the new ordinance adopts a new model that will authorize us to do uh, fee scheduling and most of the nitty gritty of the permitting uh, work that we do and a lot of the, the sort of daily uh, kinds of updates that we need to do as a rulemaking process, which more closely follows the way that the New Mexico environment does their food program. There's the statutory, statutory authority for the program and it sets the regulatory language and then the rules get into the specifics. So in the future, new fees could be set uh, mm -hmm changes in the rules, changes in any of the details or any of the language that's become problematic would be set through a rulemaking process that follows the uh, public rulemaking ordinance uh, that's already in the code. Uh, so we would actually be bound by that. We would have to uh, set a hearing officer, have a public notification, public input process, and then make recommendations that would have to be adopted on that rather than just something that the department's gonna wake up one day and decide to charge more. Thank, Thank you. you for that background. Um, a couple of follow-up questions, if I may, Mr. Chair. Councilor people go ahead. Okay, thank you. So the the rationale for having the rulemaking process in this bill rather than just putting in 
the new fees is that that's the way the state sets fees. Is that what I am to understand? Chair Sanchez and Council Feeble Corn. Um, no, I would say that's more of a of a parallel to draw, just so that it doesn't sound like something that we dreamt up on our own. There's an example out there uh, of a sister agency that's doing something very similar. The logic for us, um, as Ms. White already identified, uh, we we are very aware that we're on a very outdated. <laughs> There have been significant changes to the food code uh, since the last time we went through this process, which was in 2010, to adopt the 2009 food code. Um, and there have been a number of inadequacies in the current ordinance that we found along the way. Uh, we, we never fail to be surprised by some of the situations we encounter in the field. And we've sort of collected this list of things that are troubling us or make, uh, make things difficult for the inspectors. But... Uh, in some cases, we've had other regulatory needs that we had to bring to council first. In other cases, things like the pandemic or some um, changes in personnel in the department have set us back considerably. So we've had many, many reasons why we haven't been able to go through the full legislative process with this for years. But we'd ideally like to adopt the new food code every two to three years when it comes out. We'd ideally like to be able to make changes to the ordinance language when we find something that is going to continue to be problematic. Uh, the rules document as it currently stands is a little over 50 pages. So you can imagine there are many opportunities for us to miss one little thing that we have to then look to in another year. And rather than come back to council with, you know, 100 pages of ordinance and all kinds of technical details that don't necessarily mean much to anyone besides us, uh, we thought the rulemaking process would lighten the load with that a little bit and give us a little bit more flexibility to rise to challenges that occur throughout the year. But we certainly don't want to create the impression that we're not being transparent with this. The rules document is is current and finished in its in its form, uh, and we are prepared to take any kind of stakeholder input on that. We don't need to have anything new uh, done with this until the end of the summer. So we have many months where we could take once we are authorized to do rulemaking. We have many months where we can engage with the restaurant association and the other stakeholders and get the specifics of the rules correct. And then we would do that any time in the future that we wanted to make changes as well. Thank you. Councilor Brisson has another question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know if Councilor Feeblecorn was done or not. Councilor Feeblecorn, are you good? I, um, I have no. something else, but I'll, I'll go after Councilor Brisson finishes. Thank you. Councilor Brisson. Mr. Chair, Dr. Demena, so I think that the concern that I am gathering from some, uh, whether it be from here at this meeting or even outside of that, is First of all, does the ordinance have to pass before you can start really working on the rules uh, document and getting that finalized? And as far as the fees and the fee schedule. Uh, Chair Sanchez and Councilor Bassan, that's that's correct. So we haven't ever done this model in the past. So we don't currently have authorization, statutory authority to do a rulemaking to address these things. So um, the, the ordinance itself that's in front of you is very uh, stripped down to just the, the statutory authority that empowers us to do the program. The regulatory language uh, in terms of permitting and, uh, and how we would do enforcement. So it's, it's, very, it's just a structural piece. Once that is in place, that authorizes us to follow rulemaking. So as you see, we, we have already worked on and completed the rules document. We've worked on and completed the proposed fees but we can't actually start engaging with stakeholders or making any uh, like public input process until the ordinance itself is passed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up with that, I think the concern is that a lot of people are not necessarily, uh, they're not aware and very uh, in tune, myself included, on exactly what the rules making process is for the public. And so I believe that there's going to be some hesitation with once the ordinance passes behind closed doors, does the, do the rules and the fees get like amended and then added to an appendix later? Or is it something that ends up being through the pro Can you just briefly describe the process, which I hope will help put some people's mind at ease because I believe that once they understand that there still is a legal public process before the adoption of both of those appendix, append appendices, then that might help. Councilor Bassania, thank you. There, the ordinance um, that you're considering tonight contains the language that authorizes us to pursue rulemaking and specifies that it has to be in accordance with the rulemaking ordinance that's already in the code. 
And that ordinance, uh, to, to make it very brief, uh, requires us to appoint a hearing officer through the CAO's office, uh, give public notification, uh, which I think is a minimum of two weeks, uh, both written and through other methods, and then engage with stakeholders, take full input in any manner that they feel is appropriate. All of that comes into the hearing officer who synthesizes all of the different comments, any criticisms, any requests for changes, uh, and then the hearing officer makes a recommendation to the department director and to the CAO for a, a final form of what those rules would look like. Beyond what's actually required in the ordinance, uh, our, our intent and why we're getting such an early start on this is to allow time to just leave a very free form open collection of public comments as well, essentially set up something like a web page where uh, folks can just submit their written comments and we would include all that in the record as well. Uh, just to make sure that we're hearing all the voices that need to be heard. It's just, as I said, we can't start any of that process without the ordinance actually empowering us. So, Mr. Chair, I have three more and I see Councilor Feeblecorn has more, but um, so then I just, I hope that when you say public uh, notification, I would highly encourage and hope that, for example, I guarantee you that right now she is somewhere in the virtual world we need to make sure that the New Mexico Restaurant Association and other stakeholders are notified directly. And it's not just a notification in the newspaper. Um, and so I hope that that's already the intention of making sure that when you say stakeholders, it's not just the journal article. Um, and in the very back, we're hardly, well, um, I don't I don't always read it back there. So um, I hope that that's part of it. The other question I have, and then I wanna change my motion, is uh, why, can you tell us, Dr. Domena, why is it not, why did you choose not to do a fee per building as requested? Because I think that you gave a really good example of why you don't choose to do just one set permit fee per building and how that was evaluated versus what you have decided to do with the different uh, stackable, if you will, uh, fees. Uh, Chair Sanchez, Councilor Bassan, there are, there are a couple of different ways to answer that. Um, we don't we looked at how other municipalities do their billing in a way that is more predictable. So they're not working on this sliding scale. And I forgot to mention it, but the, the sliding scale actually requires us to build a full amount in advance. And then the, uh, the facility has to do a worksheet to prove to us that their last year's gross receipts did not uh, require them to pay the full 700. So they end up paying less than bill, which also wreaks havoc on our accounting. Um, that, that method has not been good for us. It makes it very difficult for us to know, even when we've collected the revenue that we're due, we looked at some more fixed kind of approaches that we could do that would be say square footage. Um, but if you can imagine a very large kitchen that maybe does a lot of catering as well, or just for whatever reason was built large and a very small dining room, how do we decide which part we're setting the square footage on, uh, versus the other way around? Uh, we get into certain care facilities where they may have maybe multiple dining rooms or very large dining rooms that are often not full uh, or like commercial level kitchens that are just far beyond the scope of that. So square footage let us down a lot of uh, unpalatable options. We looked at potentially doing uh, like diner load or uh, mm -hmm. occupancy load. That is a number that's hard for us to go back and obtain for some of the facilities that have been around for a very long time. Uh, and we would have had to kind of do like a case by case, look them up, talk to the fire marshal's office, go in and take measurements. Uh, that would have just been very impractical to try to do the conversion over. Uh, but the reality is that the way the food code is set up and the way that our program is set up, because we are looking at risk-based facilities, a high risk facility takes us a lot longer to do an inspection and requires a lot more response from us if there's a foodborne outbreak or if there's something we find that's out of whack. <clears throat> so we felt it was uh, only fair to have those more complicated facilities carry a, a larger share of the permit load or the, the fee load and something very small that just does, you know, uh, Cokes and chips and doesn't require a lot of time from our inspectors. And Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Domenic, can you just elaborate? I thought the example that you all gave me when we were discussing of Top Golf is a great one where they have five different levels, five different bars, but one big kitchen. And if it was just one, one fee per building and per, uh, enterprise uh, establishment, then if there was one problem with one of the sinks at one of the bars on one of the floors, the whole place gets shut down. If, that, that's, if that's correct or incorrect, can you elaborate on that? Because I think that that's very key point for why it might, it's going to be, a, in my opinion, a little bit better to have that $200 additional fee for a different part versus just one per establishment. 
Councilor Bassan, I apologize. I misunderstood what you were asking before. Um, that uh, what you're talking about is secondary fees where a facility would have um, every facility that has multiple permits would have a primary permit, which really reflects what they are, I guess, most about in terms of their food service. Like you said, in that case, the kitchen. Um, if you can imagine a facility that has a very small sidebar of food service, something that we would actually charge a secondary permit for, if that secondary permit inspection yields something that would normally require a closure, uh, I think the example that I gave you the other day was a lack of hot water for wear washing or hand washing. If they are not severable and separate permits, we would have to suspend or close the permit, which would affect the entire facility. So it's actually preferable, um, although I, I know when it comes down to dollars and cents, brass tax level, some of the facilities feel like we're nickel and diming them with secondary permits, but it's actually preferable for them. And we do this frequently where we will only close the separate permit and the entire facility itself can continue to operate. Sure. Vice versa, we could close the primary permit and the secondary permit would still stand alone as well. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, the last thing is that I know that there is still commentary. I know there's still work. I think there's probably some room for you know improvement, change, further discussion. I do think that the other counselors have a right to be able to weigh in. Uh, I don't wanna hold this up in committee if at all possible, but I know that you know once we finish tonight, it'll get reported out at the next council meeting for the next council meeting for us to hear it, which allows us some time to continue evaluating uh, everything. But also, you know, I wanna make sure to tell viewers and those I've been working with too, that we could always defer it there if we haven't had the sufficient amount of time to make some of these changes or make sure to answer more of the questions and have more input if need be. Uh, so I would like to change my motion to a motion without recommendation so that this will continue to move out of committee because I do think we have a really solid uh, example, a really solid bill right now. And if there are changes, I don't think they're going to be very massive. And I'm hoping that we can go ahead and discuss it further at, at, in two more council meetings. Okay, we've got another question from Councillor Feeblecorn. And Mr. then Chair, uh, is there a second or who or, I don't know who seconded the original second, a second by Councillor Champagne originally did the second. So he'd have to second it. No second. He seconds it. So so our motion now is uh move to no rec. And we have a second. Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just, you know, as a person who does live in the world where there are rulemakings right and left, um, I just want to say a few things about this process and the reason that I am very, very nervous about this. I have absolutely no, no problem with the rulemaking where experts like Dr. Domena are setting the rules by which an ordinance can be implemented. He is the expert having the, you know, the restaurant association, all those folks involved in developing how an ordinance is implemented makes total sense to me. Um, where I have a problem is having a rulemaking that results in fees that are set not by city council. Um, fees in my mind should be set by council and not by the administration. Um, we have, lots of fees in other areas that are not working out the way we wanted them to. And we are the appropriators. We are the ones that should be saying what things are coming in as terms of revenue and how it's spent. And so um, while, again, I have no problem with the rulemaking process for implementation, although it can be long and painful. And if we are trying to speed anything up, rulemaking will not do that. I just cannot support fees being decided upon in a rulemaking and not coming back to council for approval. Thank you, Councilor People's Board. Um, some of the things that caught my eye um, is I just wanted to ask, um, when I, 2009, 2009 is when we had the last uh, food, co uh, food code, um, and now some other troubling things have come up. Can you explain some of those troubling things that have come up? Uh, absolutely, Chair Sanchez. Uh, thank you. The, the food code itself is not necessarily troubling. It has been an evolutionary document. So in the interim, there's been, um, I want to say, a 2000, uh, certainly a 2017 food code some of our other agencies were on. And I think there was a 2013 in there as well. And each version of the food code itself addresses things that have changed in the industry. 
So some of the things that are coming out with the newest food code, they are addressing new allergens that are required for labeling. That's a big one that we want to capture. Uh, the most important, in my mind, addition in the 22 food code has to do with uh, how donated food uh, with like charitable organizations is handled. Um, this is this goes back many years, but we did have a program. We had to get very creative with how we permitted that would allow food overages at catered events, things like balloon fiesta tents to be uh, reclaimed and repurposed for people who needed meals. We had to get very creative to do that because the food code, the old food code that we're on does not allow for that. And we, we wanted to avoid having all kinds of holes punched in what we did and didn't take out of the food code because we'd adopted it entirely by reference. But the food code itself doesn't create a lot of problems. It, it just introduces, and I think Carol actually, Carol White mentioned it, uh, it adopts the latest science, the latest knowledge of food safety. So that's that's really where we want to be uh, and where other agencies are at. And this will be an opportunity for us to finally sync up with Bernalillo County in New Mexico, uh, the state of New Mexico. So anywhere you go in the state now, you'll have a similar experience, similar rules, as opposed to Albuquerque being, you know, some many, many years up behind uh, behind the curve. Um, where we have seen most of the issues, uh, the things that we want to fix, uh, one example comes from uh, uh, a very dicey enforcement action we had to take that got held up for weeks and weeks because we had gotten tripped up on how the, the service language uh, is in the old ordinance. It required a certified mail to be, certif to, to be signed for by a recipient. We had already been crossing swords with that facility for many weeks prior to that. So you can imagine when they receive a certified letter from the city of Albuquerque, they weren't too enthusiastic to sign for it and they refused it. And we were at a standstill because we couldn't officially serve them under the, the language of the old ordinance. So we've kind of uh, uh, updated things like that. We've updated some of the terminology we use for things like person in charge so that when we go in, we don't have to have, well, the owner's not here, he lives in California and we can't actually interact with an owner. Um, we've encountered things, and we, we encountered a lot of this during uh, pandemic inspections where facilities would take their sticker down when we put a red sticker, or they would hide it. And technically that wasn't illegal under the old ordinance and, and still currently isn't. So red or green becomes less of a critical question when they just take the red away. Um, we've had a lot of difficulties with uh, facilities barring our inspectors access we do have a process in the existing ordinance to overcome that, but it requires a criminal complaint and taking uh, the facility to court, which, it, as you can imagine, brings weeks and weeks of delay and all kinds of problems. Uh, and we don't tend to get a warm reception from judges over something like that. So that's some of the change that you see as well as allowing for civil violations where we can uh, kind of take matters in our own hands just to ensure that our, our inspector can gain access. So it's just these kind of like everyday technical, and there's there's many more examples that I won't bore everyone with, but these are the kind of technical everyday things that we're trying to address. Thank you very much for those expl for those explanations. They're very informative. Um, also, the last thing that I have a comment on is the we heard we've heard several times that there's many stakeholders and some of them have not been informed. So I think it's really important that if we pass this without rec that uh, we really get on to the stick to make sure that we or um, get these individuals um, notified. And that's basically it for me. Anyone else? All right, so with that, um, we changed the motion and we're voting on um, moving on to council for no rec, with no rec. Ready for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Champagne. Yes. Councilor Peeblecourt? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. That passes on a 4 0 vote. Okay, we will now move on to agenda item J. That's O 16. Councilor Sampine for Baca. It's O 24 16, amending chapter 2, article 4 of the city code relating to elections and petitions. I uh, move to do pass. Second. Um, Councillor Feeblecorn has a second. Thank you, Councillor Feeblecorn. Um, Councillor, did you want to explain? Uh, this is by request uh, okay, from so... the admin to Councillor Baca. Um, he asked me to represent it or present it tonight. I do have a question for the admin. Reference this, though. Mr. Chair, maybe you want to have Mr. Watson explain it a little bit. Thank you. Mr. Watson, can you keep please give us... Elaborate on the changes, please. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Council Rasan, uh, for teeing this up, and uh, Council Champagne as well. So every other year, we do a cleanup on our ordinances and the charter provisions governing our elections. Uh, this year is no different. We are currently working with council staff on a charter cleanup, and this is the ordinance cleanup. Uh, this ordinance cleanup, the main focus of it is to simplify our the provisions governing elections. Uh, there is currently a provision in the charter which prohibits people from using the open and ethical elections funds for for alcoholic beverages or for paying voters. This again makes totally sense, but it's already in the charter. Because it's in the charter, it doesn't need to be in the ordinances. And so this just removes it from the ordinances. Uh, that is the thrust of what this does. Uh, there's also just a technical clarification on when um, elected, newly elected officials need to come meet with me uh, following the election to uh, take the oath of office. Um, and those, that's it. So um, two minor cleanups, and um, I'm here for any questions the council may has. Councilor Chapman? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You actually answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I am not allowing, uh, I am not moving to allow anyone to use open and ethical election funds to buy alcohol. I don't think any of us did it. So <laughs> I took my other question away. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Fiebelford. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. We will now move on to agenda item K. That's O 18. Councillor Fiebelford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is 018, amending 21117 of the City of Albuquerque Code of Ordinances to improve the city's grants administrative processes. I move it to pass. Second. And we had a second by Councilor Bassan. And Councilors, any questions or comments? And I see a note here that this needs to be moved for immediate action. I can briefly um, explain it if you'd like, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Councillor Fiebelhorn, please. Thank you. So um, this is uh, Councillor Bassan, Councillor Pena, and I have been working on this because we've just had such a process with getting grant applications in um, on time, getting them approved by city council. We often get them late. Um, and we do have a period of time over the next two years where there's going to be a lot of grant applications going in. Um, because of all the federal funding. And I think we all agree that we want to apply for all the free money that we can possibly get. And so to streamline the, uh, the, the process, we're saying that um, only when there's a match requirement would you need to put, would the administration need to send us an EC that says we applied for this grant and they have to send it to us at the same time that they put in the application. Um, and then we get to it when we get to it. But it's not holding up the application process for the grants. If there's no match requirement, there is no need to send us an EC. Then twice a year, we would get a list of all the grants that were applied for, whether or not there were matches required. So that we would know what the city is, is requesting, what we're going after, so we can make sure that we see what all the departments are asking for and you know, and which departments are going for grants and which aren't. Um, but the the timing on it, only if it's a grant that has a requirement of a match, would we get an immediate EC that includes either a copy of the grant application or at least a copy of the executive summary so that we could decide at that point if it's something that we want to um, approve since there is a match requirement in there. So with that, um, I'm happy to have Councillor Brisson add anything that I forgot. Councilor Hassan. Mr. Chair, everything I was going to add, she made sure to knock out. Good job. Perfect. I'm, I'm actually glad that you ladies got together and, and got this done. The whole question that I have for uh, the administration is, is are they going to make sure that they have somebody assigned to oversee the grants, so that the same kind of falling through the cracks doesn't happen um, at all this, this time around? Council Chair, we've got uh, Donna Sandoval uh, here to speak on that, our director. 
Thank you. Councilor Sanchez, councilors, um, we have a grant administrator in the accounting division. Um, she oversees uh, the grants for all the departments and that um, she would be responsible for this. And Mr. Chair, if I may add that, you know, this really does simplify the process for all the departments because what they do is they prepare the grant application, they submit it, and then they send us a copy, basically. And so it does make it much simpler for them. And I expect that they would be much more able to, you know, stay on top of it since they're literally just sending us a copy of either the proposal or the executive summary. Thanks. Sounds like we're going to have a lot better grant process moving forward. So um, any other questions, comments? With that, we'll move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. This is on a 4-0 vote. And now we need to vote for immediate action. Mr. Chair, I would like to make a motion for immediate action. And do we have a second? Second. Thank you by Councillor Peeblecorn. And it looks like we're ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That is on a 4 0 vote. Thank you. We will now move on to agenda item L. That's R 14. Um, Peeblecorn, the Rogers by request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all right. This is R 14. Approving and authorizing the filing of a grant application for a violence intervention fund grant with the New Mexico Department of Health, Office of Gun Violence Prevention, providing an appropriation to the Albuquerque Community Safety Department in fiscal year 2024. I will move it to pass. Second. Second by Councilor Bassan. And any comments from Mayor's conference room? Um, do we have anybody to explain it real quick? Uh, Council Chair, we've got uh, some staff here to explain. We've got Jeffrey here to explain. Thank you, Jeff. Council Chair, uh, Councilors, this is the appropriation for the application to the New Mexico Department of Health Violence Intervention Fund, which is an appropriation at the state level supporting uh, expanded violence intervention work throughout the state. Uh, this would allow the Albuquerque Police Department, Albuquerque Community Safety, and uh, to expand their work in partnership with the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, uh, doing violence intervention work uh, across the entire county. Okay, and the fiscal impact? I It was sent over last week. Counselors, I can uh, make sure to circle back. No, no, we have it. Okay, just wanted to make sure that uh, the public we have, we have the fiscal. We impact. have the okay. fiscal impact. We're we'll explaining the grant. Okay. okay. Uh, so within uh, the itemized budget that you have includes funding for, uh, and a really important highlight that I'm going to actually lead with is funding for community-based organizations. Per the grant requirements, at least 50% of the funding must go to community-based organizations, which would be identified some by county, some by uh, city. Uh, in addition to that, funding will support personnel both for the county sheriff's office uh, as well as Albuquerque Police Department and credible messengers uh, who have historically been the Albuquerque Community Safety Commitment out of that, as well as some promotional materials and things so we can update uh, the violence intervention work with the new partnership. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, uh, I'm just wondering, because I'm not opposed to working and collaborating with the county, and I just know that it's been previous discussions where the behavioral health tax and all of the funding that goes into the county and how is that being used in collaboration with the city? So with the city doing this and filing for this grant, I just want to make sure that we're still prioritizing the city of Albuquerque, and I'm sure we will. Uh, but I do, I do think that it's important to make sure to say out loud that while collaborating between the city and the county, the collaboration should work both ways. And I'm I'm hopeful that that agreement will be put in place should the grant be awarded. Thank you. Mayor's conference room. Understood and, and uh, will be uh, appreciated. I'd like to go ahead. Um, 
City Councilors, I think part of this and just in full transparency with this actual grant, typically this is something that um, ACS and the city would push heavily on. This was one of those that pretty much the only way we could apply for this funding is if we partnered with the county. So we what we feel like we could be a stronger lead on this, given the sometimes bureaucracies that happen at the county that delay some of the funding to come to the city. So this way it allows us to be in control of then pushing it out to them and ultimately we'll be in, we can push the timeliness of this grant out faster. So I, I agree. We feel we have proposals into the county for additional funding. Um, our hope is that we can continue to work in good faith um, and um, hopefully be able to use some of that BHI funding in the near future. So thank you for that. No problem. And I just wanted to clarify, I'm sitting here in the notes that uh, plans allocate, uh, there's plans to allocate three detectives and one sergeant from BCSO. Is that correct? Yes, the, the grant has to be split down the middle, so we felt that it was fair to give them their sergeants and their detectives while we, ours are already heavily funded, and so we will be allowing for biweekly collateral collateral um, funding for our, we have two detectives that are already set up with ACS to go out, so we'll be helping to pay for their collateral duty. Thank you. Any other questions? With that, we'll go to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Fieberhorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on the zero vote. Okay, I think we're on to uh, agenda item M, is that right? Um, no, that's 30. Oh, Councillor Champagne. Yes, R2425. Approving and authorizing the acceptance of the grant funds from the New Mexico State Library for the basic state grants in an aid in providing for an appropriation to the Department of Arts and Cultural for the fiscal year of 2024. Again, by request, uh, if you have questions, I believe there's someone in the admin office that can answer or clarify. And uh, move to do pass. And second. Second by Councilor Feeblecorn. And you said that there was someone to explain there this. Be, yeah. Okay, Mayor's Conference Room. Oh. Hope. Shell Sanchez. Oh, I'm here. Shell Sanchez, Director of Arts and Culture. Um, yeah, very quick background on this. This is actually an annual appropriation um, that the public library system receives through the state library. I know it says it's a grant. Um, but actually it's an annual appropriation that comes through every legislative session. The amounts vary a little bit each year, but this is just one of our many uh, funding sources for the public library system. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If none, um, we'll move to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Champagne. Yes. Councilor Peeblehorn. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 4 0 vote. And we will now move on to. What's up? Oh, okay. And it will be. All right. We'll, move, we'll now move on to agenda item N. That's R30, Councilor Feeblecorn by request. But I just got a note there. Thank so, you, Mr. Go Chair. Ahead, R30 is adopting the 2024 action plan and program investment summary for the CDBG home and ESG funds, providing an appropriation to the Department of Family and Community Services for 2024 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development entitlement funds. I'm actually going to move a deferral to the next FGO meeting. Second. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is the deferral next FGO meeting, seconded by Councillor Bassan, and we're ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Champagne. Yes. Councillor Fievelcorn. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. It passes on a 4-0 vote. There being no further business, this FGO meeting 